At this point, I'd like to just uh, introduce someone who doesn't need an introduction. In his very uh, early career, he has uh, outshone everyone in this field. Dr. Uh, Postow comes to us from uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, and uh, hopefully we can convince him never to go back. <laughs> in the short time that he's been here, these 24 hours, he's already authored another New England Journal article. Um, and his, his future, like uh, the future for therapy for melanoma, is, is bright. And it's just a pleasure to introduce him and bring him up here uh, for you to meet him. So thank you. Well, uh, I'd like to th thank Dr. Hamid for having us here, and, and thank you all for your attention. It's a real honor uh, to, to be speaking with everyone today about uh, all these exciting advances that we've been seeing and hearing about all morning. Some of this will be a little bit of a review just in concept about what we've been hearing so far, but then we'll be taking it to another step about what's new, what's on the horizon, what are the next targets going to be, and how are those going to be important? as we learn about where we've come from. So this talk will be new checkpoint pathways and novel treatments. Um, these are the disclosures I have. It's a little shorter list, but I hope to, to get it longer as time goes on. Um, immune therapy is very, very simple. It may be seemingly very complex, but it's as simple as a cancer cell being killed by a T cell. So here in the middle, you can see a red cancer cell, looks like a, a meatball. Um, and then you have T cells coming in that just kill the cancer cell. So that's as simple as it needs to be. So all we've been talking about this morning so far are how do we get these T cells to kill the cancer cells better. So it's a bit more complicated than just the T cell killing the cancer cell. How does it get to that point? This is a bit of a review slightly from what we've been talking about. Essentially what you see here on the left part of this is a tumor in, in these gray cells. And these little star-like yellow kind of uh, you know, electrical burst things, these are tumor antigens. And tumor antigens are released by tumors through many different things. Some people think if you radiate a tumor, it releases all these antigens or if you give chemotherapy, it might release tumor antigens, or maybe these tumor antigens are just coming off of the tumor all the time anyways. But these tumor antigens come off of the tumor, they're picked up by these cells called dendritic cells, which we were talking about in some of the prior talks as well. Dendritic cells take these antigens from the tumor, these are little pieces of the tumor, and say, these don't belong, there's something weird about this. Look at this protein immune system, I'm a dendritic cell, I'm showing you this antigenic protein, there's something wrong here, you need to recognize, wake up, come and kill this. And so in lymph node tissues and other tissues in the body, these dendritic cells show T cells these antigenic proteins, and then the T cells come through the bloodstream, go to the tumor, and try to destroy the tumor. So that's how it should work, and what we know is that the T cells and the tumors are in this tug of war, push and pull, and trying to, to really kind of see who's going to win this battle. And what we know from patients uh, dealing with all this and, and, and melanoma is that sometimes the immune system is just not strong enough. And uh, Dr. Hamid blew the punchline on this. But no matter how hard we're pushing here, no matter how hard we're trying to push over this melanoma, it's just not hard enough. We need a little bit of help. You know, this guy's trying. This is the immune system here sometimes, okay? And uh, I don't know if this is a real person or what this is, but it's uh, kind of scary. Regardless, we need to help this a little bit more. So how do we do that? So we've talked about a couple of strategies today, and uh, many of us that have taken drugs like ipilimumab or PD-1 drugs like nivolumab or pembrolizumab, they all work by taking off the brake on the car. We've talked a lot about that today as well, but, but really how it all works again, just for some review, is these dendritic cells present this antigen I was telling you about, those little stars coming off of the tumor. They present this antigen to a T cell receptor here, and that helps turn on the T cell. But in addition to that signal, it requires a second signal. Just showing this protein by itself is not enough. It has to show the protein, then it has to kick it in the butt, say, go get it, go get the tumor. 
And that second signal is called CD28. That normally would turn on a T cell, and we know we have to maintain very, very important homeostasis or equilibrium to keep T cells from being too active all the time. And that's why this molecule called CTLA4 gets expressed on the plasma membrane or the cell surface, and that turns off this T cell. So it's kind of this push and pull, positive and negative, to keep the T cell right at that exact level that you want it to be, not too active, or we would develop autoimmune disease like ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, rheumatoid arthritis, but not too inactive, or we're not gonna be able to push over that, that big melanoma guy. So uh, we also know that PD-1 is another checkpoint, and these are the traditional checkpoints just to set the stage for some of the new targets. PD-1 is a, a, another checkpoint that we believe is important at multiple steps along the immune system. Uh, most relevant, perhaps, might be when the T cell comes and tries to destroy the tumor. The tumor expresses something called PD-L1, which is the binding partner for PD-1, one of the binding partners for PD-1. And when PD-L1 is expressed by the tumor, the tumor is basically sticking out a sword saying, you're not going to be able to kill the T cell. And the T cell is trying to come in and kill the tumor, and the tumor is fighting back with PDL1. That's a bit of a somewhat oversimplified view because we know that PDL1 is involved in, in multiple steps in the immune system. Multiple different cells express PDL1, uh, but at, at least um, you know, that's, a, that's a starting point. So, so this is what we've come from CTLA4 blockade. PD-1 blockade. This is where we have now FDA-approved drugs that we've been hearing about throughout the course of this meeting in the immune therapy space with ipilimumab, nivolumab, and pembrolizumab and combinations thereof. But if we remember the basic principle, we need to get the T cell to kill the cancer cell. That's all that needs to happen. We heard from Dr. Ferries before this, maybe we should just be giving patients their own T cells back to them or other modified T cells back to them so that we can try to just bring the T cells in themselves a little bit enhanced from, from laboratory preparation. And, but we also know that these T cells in our own bodies are regulated by many on and off switches. And we remember that we've talked about this car, that it's a brake and a gas pedal. We've, we've heard about that. There are go signals and stop signals. And we remember from the prior talk, too, that this may not just be a car, this may be a space shuttle, that there are many go and stop switches. And that is really the truth. Because when we think about the multiple brakes that could be blocked here, CTLA-4 and PD-1, so far we've done, but there are multiple other ones as well that are being targeted in early phase clinical trials. Particularly LAG-3 is in early phase clinical trials, uh, either by itself or in combination with targets that block PD-1. In addition to these blocking the negative side of this and turning on the T cell through two negative, uh, blocking a negative, we also have these go signals on the T cells that help by pushing them forward more. And CD28, OX40, Gitter, CD137, and some of these other targets, these are also in early phase clinical trials, mostly all phase one clinical trials for the most part just at this point. And so we need to be very careful when we're giving patients drugs that boost the immune system. Some of us know from some of the side effects that can be experienced from some of these drugs that boost the immune system, even by taking off the brake, we can have a problem with some side effects. And when you hit the gas pedal, there can be side effects as well that are problematic. So the first gas pedal that perhaps was targeted was this one called CD28. And so um, what we know from CD28 as, as one of these particular targets. Uh, this is, again, the, the second signal. Remember when I said that the, the a dendritic cell shows the protein and it kicks it in the butt? This is the kick in the butt. When you give an antibody that, that does that, that, that agonizes the CD28 activation signal, severe side effects can happen. And actually, this was a drug that was tested with a few patients in, uh, overseas in England where there were six young, healthy male patients that were treated with an agonist, or a GO signal antibody against this target called CD28. And these patients, unfortunately, even within minutes of getting this drug, had very severe symptoms of swelling and fevers and blood pressure going up and down. And these patients had to go into the intensive care unit. Fortunately, no patients died from this experience. But these were healthy patients that were taking this experimental treatment just to see how, you know, what, what would happen. 
And it really was a reminder uh, of many, many issues in clinical trials, but a reminder of the power of the immune system and a reminder that we have to be very careful when we hit the gas pedal on the immune system uh, and, and we really need to be selective about, uh, about how we do that. And this is a, a, a picture from one of the articles online that, that came about it. It was, uh, at this particular target, was a, a, a London drug trial catastrophe and a lot of things that, that went horribly wrong, unfortunately, in this very first experience. But we've learned a lot from that first experience. We've learned that we can't target CD28 in that particular strategy. But we're targeting other GO signals, other gas pedals in that spaceship or other uh, GO signals on the T cell. And another one that we're targeting now that's, that's newer is one called OX40. OX40 helps these T cells proliferate and um, increases their effector function, just so their ability to, to kill that T cell. And there has been a phase one clinical trial already with an OX40 agonistic antibody that was done um, and published already. And the results from this uh, were done in patients that had many different kinds of cancer. So it wasn't just melanoma. These were, they were, these were other tumors as well. Uh, but the trial did have patients with melanoma in it. So what do we know about this particular OX40 antibody? And this was a mouse antibody, so it's not necessarily the same antibody that's being done in other trials of OX40 now. In this particular trial with the mouse antibody, the maximum tolerated dose was not reached. So very different from that CD28 experience, this OX40 seemed to be better tolerated. There were some patients with fevers and chills and, and some achy joints, but generally it was well tolerated. And some people in this group had stoppage of the growth of their cancers, and some people had some, some little shrinkage of their tumors. Uh, they didn't, when we measure them in clinical trials, we do it in a very different type of way, and there were no uh, formal, what are called resist partial responses, but that doesn't mean that people didn't have benefit with shrinking their tumors. And actually, the two people, uh, two of the patients with melanoma in this trial had some mixed responses of, of some shrinkage of some of the tumors. And so OX40 is one of the targets that's a new target. It's one of the GO signals. It's a target that is in clinical trials right now with different companies making different antibodies, a little different from the mouse antibody that we had done uh, in the other study. Uh, now that these are more uh, humanized. So our hope is that this will be more effective for patients. And this is a picture uh, of, of a patient with melanoma. You can see here in the lung on the right side, there's this uh, lung tumor here. Five months into treatment, the lung tumor was, was basically gone, just some inflammation right in that area. This right here was some soft tissue disease uh, up in the neck, and a month later with this OX40 antibody, uh, much improved. So this can work. It doesn't work in everyone, unfortunately. We need it to work in everybody. But it's another principle to say, even if we hit the gas pedal, on a totally brand new target, we may see some early efficacy, and so there's some early promise with that as well. There's another GO signal. This one is called CD137, or uh, 41BB, and a different target altogether from the OX40, but essentially similar. Multiple different companies have been uh, developing drugs against this particular target, uh, including a couple of those that are listed here. One of the ones uh, that has been investigated already is called Urelimab. And that, in early studies at a, at a higher dose, was associated with some problems with liver inflammation. So as was uh, you know, necessary, lower doses were explored, and, and that uh, is still being evaluated, at, being evaluated at lower doses. And another company, this other compound here, uh, made by another company, showed that there was a response, so a, a formal response with this particular target. And then another patient with melanoma had a mixed response. So some tumors were actually getting better with this other target, CD137. So now we've seen two gas pedals actually showing some types of good uh, results so far. These are very early in clinical investigation. So whether or not one is better than the other, whether or not um, other ones like Gitter, which is another target that's in clinical trials now, whether those are going to be better than the ones we've seen so far with OX40 and CD137, I think it's really honestly too early to tell. But just again, we see great effects with the ipilimumabs and PD-1 drugs here. We're st starting to see some early signs on the other side. Maybe we need to combine the go signal and the stop signal. That might even be better than just one side by itself. 
So when we think about the T cells killing the tumor, we've talked about ways that we can turn on the T cells better by hitting the gas or taking off the brake. But equally importantly, within the tumor itself, there are a bunch of negative type things that like to live and that prevent the T cells from getting into the tumors and trying to destroy them. So what are a couple of those things? Well, one of them is this enzyme, which is called IDO. And it's, uh, st IDO stands for indolamine 2,3-dioxygenase. And this is an enzyme that's expressed by many different kinds of cancers, not just melanoma, but other types of tumors as well. How does IDO inside a tumor suppress the T cell's ability to kill it? Well, IDO does a couple of things that we believe are bad for the immune system. One, it depletes an amino acid. So amino acids are building blocks to proteins. It depletes an amino acid called tryptophan. And tryptophan is a very important amino acid for T cells to function well. And when this enzyme depletes this amino acid, it's like taking away the food from these T cells, and the T cells don't have the food to be able to kill the, the cancer. And so in addition to this enzyme taking away the food for these T cells in the tumor microenvironment, it also produces this substance called kynurinine, which is believed to be toxic to certain kinds of T cells and to diminish their efficacy. So if we think this enzyme is bad within tumors, we need to think of ways, well, maybe if we stop this enzyme, maybe we'll enhance the efficacy of other T cell strategies like we've been talking about in killing these tumors. So how did that work? Well, by itself, it didn't necessarily show as much promise as we would like. By itself, it did stabilize growth of cancers. But what we really want to do is try to shrink it. So by itself, it was studied in 52 patients. Uh, unfortunately, there were no formal responses, but it did, again, arrest cancer growth. But where we're thinking it might be most effective is not just by itself, but in combination with all these other uh, drugs that boost the T cell's ability to kill cancer. And this is a study in, in mice. And I'll just draw your attention to a couple of these here. This uh, top panel here shows that when mice were given the CTLA-4 blocking antibody in this particular study, they did a little bit better than the mice that didn't. But when you took out IDO, you took out this enzyme, this bad enzyme, the, the mouse uh, experiment showed that those mice did even better. And if you look at how many of the, these mice had their tumors growing, when you took out both CTLA-4 and you took out this negative enzyme, the mice actually did better than just, people that, uh, just the mice that got one by itself. So if it works in the mouse experiments, it's logical to say, well, maybe this combination would work in patients as well. And that's what's being done. There's a clinical trial that's currently ongoing that's combining ipilimumab with IDO blockade or blocking this negative enzyme. And the phase, two, uh, phase one study really suggested that ipilimumab at three milligrams per kilogram, that's the dose that's FDA approved, can be combined with this particular IDO inhibitor. And that among 12 patients that hadn't had prior immune therapy, there were patients that had uh, partial responses according to the immune-related response criteria. We don't know how well yet this compares to ipilimumab alone, but it does look very promising because this is a pretty high percent. Again, it's a very small group, so it's really hard to say this definitively is better without a randomized trial data. Uh, and, and we are trying to study that in more depth. But uh, again, just promise of combination therapy a little bit early. Really, we're interested in IDO in combination with PD-1 drugs, maybe IDO in combination with ipilimumab and PD-1 drugs. And those are kinds of new studies that are coming forward that are looking for patients uh, as we speak. This is, the, again, the waterfall plot that we've been seeing. These are patients. This is a patient with a complete response that had this IDO blocking antibody and ipilimumab. And uh, you can see that these um, uh, patients that have, even without having a response, it can control the cancer for a long period of time without, without cancer growth. So again, an example of an interesting combination. Not yet clear if it's better than ipilimumab alone, but something that, that we hope will be, certainly. This is that patient that had complete disappearance of their melanoma. This is a patient at baseline. And you can see here in the lung, there's this uh, little melanoma area. And over time, a couple months, it gets a little smaller. And then by four months, it's, it's basically gone. So again, very impressive uh, and, and something that, that we're really uh, looking forward to, to seeing more. We want to know, is it safe to do these combinations? This is just a, a panel of the side effects that we're seeing. Essentially, the bottom line is we think it is safe. We need more information, but the side effects didn't look that much different than ipilimumab alone. Perhaps there needs to be a little bit of attention to some liver 
uh, test monitoring because sometimes there can be a little bit of liver irritation with, with this particular drug. When we think about those negative things that live inside the tumors that might be bad for the T cell's ability to kill it, in addition to the IDO enzyme that we talked about, we, uh, there's just a brief mention on these regulatory T cells. And these regulatory T cells are the T cells that suppress the killer T cells from doing their job. And if you think about it, these are just the T cells killing a cancer. And these regulatory T cells live within the cancer and they kind of set up this force field around the tumor and it's believed that that prevents the, the T cells from killing them. And so there have been a number of theories that if we can get rid of these T regulatory cells within the tumor, maybe these T cells will kill the tumors better. And so some people actually think, and this hasn't been proven in patients yet, but this has been um, shown in a number of uh, mouse experiments, that by getting rid of these T regulatory cells within the tumor itself, it might be one of the ways that drugs like ipilimumab may work. And actually, this is because these T regulatory cells express the CTLA-4 molecule, which is the target of ipilimumab. And one of the ways that ipilimumab may work, again, this is uh, still an active area of research, is by binding to these T regulatory cells. And then um, through complicated other mechanisms, other cells come in, basically, and destroy these T regulatory cells and get rid of them. Um, within the tumor microenvironment, and that then allows the T cells to come back and, and destroy the tumor. So other strategies that deplete the T regulatory cells within the tumor are being tested. There are a number of other drugs that do that, and so those are other areas of, of um, ongoing clinical investigation. But if we remember, just to wrap this up, it's just as simple as a T cell killing a tumor cell. So we've talked about that by blocking checkpoints. We've talked about that now by some of these new targets, OX40, CD137, these GO signals. We talked about the problems with CD28, that we have to be careful with the dosing on some of these kinds of approaches. And then also by getting rid of some of these negative things within the tumors themselves, like IDO, T regulatory cells, and I could go on and on with a number of other different cells that, that are trying to be targeting. So these are the targets. This list goes on and on. There's so much to explore and so much to study. And so that's why we really do encourage participation in these trials that target all these different types of new checkpoints and new targets so that we can try to do better than what we're currently doing. And, and certainly we've come very far and we should be proud of that, but we, we need to do better. So T cells can be stimulated by many different GO signals and, and, and those are the targets. And that if we keep targeting these negative signals perhaps in combination, we're hopeful for better outcomes so that we can tell every single patient that they're going to have a benefit from our treatment. And again, with that, thank you for your attention today, and uh, it's an honor to come speak with you.